I would like to start by saying um, I'm very happy to be part of this um, important platform. And in this regard, I'm, I'm very thankful to Prof. Liesel Ben As for introducing me um, to Unlocking Nature platform. Uh, <clears throat> my talk tonight is um, titled Unveiling the Beauty of Kuihaba Caves. But um, before I talk about the, the beauty of Kuihaba Caves, I want to start off by talking briefly about my career path just to you know, share with you how I got to work um, on the, in, in the caves and to give you an impression of um, how long I've been working in the caves. So <clears throat> the bulk of my training is in, in, in freshwater ecology. Um, and I would like to start off um, describing my, my, my path to the Kuihaba Caves. Um, at 2006, when I traveled to Mau to um, work as an assistant for a research team uh, from the UK, which came to uh, undertake a research in the Okavango Delta to model climatic um, threats to the um, Okavango. And <clears throat> I joined the team as, a, as, a, as an assistant. If you look on, the, on that picture, I am the young man seated, the most visible person in that, uh, seated in that uh, uh, picture. I, I worked um, as an assistant, but um, in 2007, I enrolled for a, a, a master's and MPhil degree um, use, uh, using that uh, part of training to, gen to collect the data for my own uh, study. And I did an MPhil research uh, in the Okavango Delta uh, as part of the major objective of the um, research project. And um, in my project, I looked at the distribution patterns of invertebrates or insects, um, aquatic insects in the, in the Delta, basically to examine the, the, the drivers of those patterns and um, focusing mainly on the water chemistry and um, hydrology factors. So after working, um, completing my uh, MPhil, I worked for several projects, a couple of projects um, at the Okavango Research Institute um, before getting a, a permanent em em employment with uh, BUST. And um, shortly after joining BUST, I got a government scholarship to study for my PhD at uh, University College London, uh, which was also freshwater ecology um, research because I was characterizing um, the aquatic food webs of the Delta using um, stable isotopes. But during my period, my, my study um, time, and my, my, my time at the UCL, I secured um, the Oxford African Bursary to study ecological survey techniques at uh, University of Oxford. And this uh, bursary is, is worth noting that it's only, uh, it's available for only one African yearly. So I was kind of lucky enough to get that um, prestigious um, scholarship. Um, <clears throat> the, the training at Oxford required, um, had a, a research component which um, had to be different from my ongoing PhD research. And for that, I chose to uh, study caves and I chose to work on, on Prehaba Caves. And this is because I realized that in, in Botswana, there, there is very, very limited um, research in, in, in caves. There's limited ecological um, research in caves. The biodiversity is not well understood. The functioning uh, of the caves um, is not 
um, there hasn't been there hasn't been much done to understand the, the ecosystems. So I chose to uh, study uh, the Kihaba Caves. And I, I continued working on what I was familiar with, the invertebrates. So I studied the invertebrates uh, of the Kihaba Caves. <laughs> now, before going into, you know, the describing the beauty of the Kihaba Caves in terms of its um, potential as um, a, a resource for cave ecotourism in Botswana and as a resource um, uh, to drive or to improve scientific knowledge. Um, I, would like to, I would like to give firstly just a brief introduction about cave, uh, the diversity of caves and cave biodiversity, just to give you, a, you know, a context in case you are familiar with different uh, types of caves or you haven't been, um, or you have, you haven't been to caves before. So caves are different. Um, there are different types of caves. They are ice caves found mostly in the polar regions. They are vol uh, caves formed from volcano lava uh, flow. And but tonight I want to focus on solution caves. And these are caves formed by the uh, dissolution of a limestone or similar rocks by the action of water. Rainwater is slightly acidic. And um, when it uh, interacts with limestone, it dissolves it. I want you to think of limestone um, as a, a material similar to that which build, builds on, kettle, on a kettle uh, element or when it is used um, for, for some time, that um, can easily be dissolved using a weak um, acid like, like vinegar. So the action of rainwater dissolves limestone in a similar uh, manner, but um, because it, it, it also combined with physical um, erosion, so it more like dissolves and then moves that uh, material out and that creates what can be thought of as part of a, a an underground um, plumbing system, um, <clears throat> and this is usually the, the the shape of the cave will form uh, in direction um, in the direction or in the axis of the water flow. For example, on the picture on the top left picture, you see is uh, Mr. Marenga at Kihava Caves um, on the northern entrance of the cave. So there's northern entrance and the southern entrance. And this gives you an idea of um, how the direction or the axis of the water movement as it dissolved um, the, the bedrock, the, the um, dolomite uh, bedrock, which is, dolomite is it's a similar, uh, a, to a, a rock to um, limestone. So it's also dissolved by rainwater. So caves um, have a tendency to destroy what they have created. For example, um, as the cave um, a, a roof continues to be, you know, uh, dissolved by this rainwater, it can collapse. When it collapse, it forms, when the, when the roof collapses, it forms a, a pit cave, which is more vertical than um, the, for example, the, the, the one, bef the, the, the cave above, which is a bit horizontal in, in axis. Um, I would also want to share the diversity of, of caves in terms of size. Caves are different in terms, uh, in terms of size. They are, very large caves, and there are caves which um, really they, they, they are less accessible. You have to maybe crawl, but as long as they are accessible by human, they are caves. And on the left is a very uh, um, not popular but well known cave, the Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, USA. This is the largest um, solution, the, the largest cave in the whole world. And you can see a tourist um, and, and the amount of space that is um, 
you know, surrounding the tourists there. And the cave is also uh, known uh, in term, academically in terms of the evolution of ideas in cave ecology, because um, it has, uh, you know, some of the ideas that developed in cave ecology uh, started uh, by studying some species, fish um, species, blind fish species from uh, the mammoth the cave. <clears throat> so, talking of um, cave diversity, uh, uh, biodiversity, uh, caves have unique biodiversity. But before I talk about the, 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 the biodiversity of caves, I want to also highlight that within a cave system, there are different zones. There's the entrance zone where there's um, light, there's sufficient light and algae can, can, can grow because there's light. And then as you move into the cave, there's a zone called a twilight zone where the light uh, becomes limited it's not totally dark, but it's kind of um, sunset dim. And then as you move further into the cave, you get into a zone which is totally dark. Um, if you if you are in that zone and you switch off um, the, the, the torches or the, the light sources you will be using to navigate the cave, it's similar to with, uh, closing your eyes or being folded with a very dark cloth such that you cannot see anything. So I want you to know this um, uh, different uh, zones of the caves, which are common across uh, different cave types of caves. So cave biodiversity is, is unique. You have the types of organisms you will find in a cave include that those organisms, live organisms, you would find likely at the cave entrance, which um, uh, would have fallen into the cave and are still alive and moving around, but they, they are not really cave species. They are there by accident, and this uh, sometimes referred to as um, accidentals. And then you have um, cave species which um, live in the cave and, and complete their life cycles in the cave, but they can also complete their life cycles outside the cave. And this, uh, these are facultative habitant, habitants of, of the cave. And then you have uh, obligate um, cave organisms, which um, permanently live in, in the cave. What you see on the top there is, is a, it's a, it's a picture of a bat. I put the, the bat there because bats are some of the very important um, organisms, um, important part of cave biodiversity, because as you can imagine, there isn't light in the cave. There is no primary production. So the cave is dependent on carbon sources or energy sources from um, land surface. And for that, it needs some organisms to more like link um, the, the inside with the, um, the inside of the cave, the ecosystem of the inside of the cave with the outside, because outside is where you know, there is um, primary production. And, cave, and, 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 and bats serve that key role they forage outside and bring back the um, energy in, 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 in the form of um, their feces or, or their, their, what's the best word, um, their droppings, okay? So, and then um, cave species, uh, some, especially those living in the darker uh, zone of the, uh, of the, of the cave, um, experience extreme environment. Uh, they are in total darkness, they are in constant high humidity, and there is limited diversity of, uh, of food resources. This makes the cave environment extreme. I have um, put this, the two pictures of a pseudoscorpion and a blind fish at the, at the bottom there. And if you look at those pictures, there's something common uh, to those pictures. The organisms are pale in color. And this is because these organisms are found in their obligate inhabitants of caves. So <clears throat> the pseudoscorpion you see, um, um, 
down there is only found in, in, in Botswana. And the blind fish you see on the right uh, uh, is only found in, in Namibia. So cave species are vulnerable. They occur generally in small numbers, and, and, and this is because uh, of limited uh, um, diversity of, of uh, food resources in, in cave ecosystems. And some cave species occur in very few caves, okay? Or in sometimes only they're restricted to one cave ecosystem. So meaning that if you lose that um, species, there's nowhere else it can ever be um, found. It's lost, totally lost for good. So in that regard, cave species are very vulnerable and they need to be conserved. Each cave management should ensure that every species is um, um, conserved. So before I go to the um, to to the um, share, to, to sharing you about um, the beauty of the Hawa caves, I, I want to also share my uh, some of the beliefs about caves, local beliefs about the caves, and uh, some of my perceptions. Well, well, my perception of caves before I started working on the caves. So <clears throat> caves are viewed generally viewed as dark places and uh, they are you know associated with wishes or evil spirits before i started you know gaining knowledge about caves caves and and, and ecology in general and i i think I, I i grew up ingrained with this um kind of beliefs and some people believe that there are huge snakes in in caves and that makes caves not interesting uh, to people uh, to you know to um, be interested well in studying caves or in visiting caves. The picture you see on the left is I, I took it is from a movie called Underneath the Caves. What I liked about that picture is the face. That face is of a terrified person, or a, it's a fearful face. Somebody who's fear afraid of something or you know uh, looking at uh, something with an uh, if anticipation of you know um i don't know sinister happenings <laughs> so i would like to tell you that i had a similar a uh, kind of mindset towards the case before i started working on the caves and um on the right i've put the picture of um a cave in, in southern Botswana in, in Molapule. This is the, the, the cave I first uh, visited. Um, it's called Lahara Laha Hobokwe or Hobokwe's um, cave. And if I tell you, um, or if you ask me um, after the tour of the cave, what do you know about caves? I was going to tell you about these beliefs that people were thrown in the caves and they're dead and therefore there are some evil spirits in the caves and you know all negative things i, I wasn't gonna tell you about a, the value of cave uh, uh, biodiversity so these are the things that as conservationists we should you know communicate conservation about um cave uh, biodiversity conservation uh, with awareness that there, there are barriers in a, a lot of mindsets. <clears throat> so now moving on to we have our caves. Um, the caves are located in a very remote area in north northwest Botswana. Um, on that picture, I've shown the caves, the approximate location of the caves, and. I think my picture is not there and it just moved a little bit. They should be a bit up, but that's, um, they're, they're in Northwest uh, Botswana. And um, they are about more than 600 kilometers from where I am. I'm communicating from this uh, yellow dot, Bust. 
And um, these caves, the Kuihara caves, as you may tell from this clicking sound, they were named by the sand people. Um, and the word Kuihara means hyena hole. And they possibly thought, you know, thought of the caves as um, a, a home of, uh, of, of a hyena. And they were first uh, known to the sand people in uh, early 30s, 1930s. And they were made uh, popular by a um, local farmer uh, called Martinez Dr uh, Drosky. And he's um, now the, the, the caves are sometimes referred to as Drosky's caves because he's the one who kind of took efforts to make the, the caves popular and known to a lot of people. So on the bottom picture, you can see um, a rock outcrop and the cave is formed under, under this uh, rig, uh, sorry, rock outcrop. And this, this will, you, uh, and on, on the other side of the, on the right side of the picture uh, is the entrance the um, southern entrance of the Bihava Caves. So within the north um, west part of Botswana, um, especially near the Bihava Caves, you have several rock outputs um, of um, dolomite type. This is a type of rock similar to the uh, limestone and they, they are, you know, they can be dissolved by rainwater. So you have, uh, for example, the Guanaka uh, Caves, which are for, which are under Guanaka uh, hills, and these are 19 kilometers from um, Kuihaba Caves. And then you also have uh, the Zodilo Caves. Like I said, caves are very diverse in terms of size. The Zodilo, Zodilo Caves are quite uh, are relatively small in size, and um, therefore are not very attractive um, to uh, people because it's, you access them with a bit of difficulty. But with the Tihaba, the beauty of Tihaba is that the caves are solid. The entrance is about five meters wide. And at some uh, part of the cave, the roof can be as high as six meters. So you can walk in uh, freely into the caves. Um, so that's why they, they, they are so, um, popular. So <clears throat> talking of the beauty of, of Tihaba Caves, I, it will be, it is uh, very important to um, mention that part of the beauty of Tihaba Caves is the, the, the cave guides. Um, in that picture, I have uh, Mr. Marenga uh, on, on my, on your, 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 your left when on the left side of the screen, but on my right in that picture. And then um, Mr. Foster on my left on that picture. And uh, if you look well on those faces, this was before, this picture was taken before I got into the, into the cave, my first ever picture at Bihava. And, and I was about to get into the cave. You can look, uh, see my face, of uncertainty because I still had a bit of, you know, those traces uh, um, of um, uh, perceptions of caves that I grew up with. And then you see the face of Mr. Maranga smiling, a very calming kind of uh, a, a smile. And then you have a determined face from uh, Mr. Foster. So this, um, they are very, they are beautiful. Uh, they form part of the, beauty of they have a caves that you can expect. So I'll take you through the internal beauty of the they have a caves in terms of uh, the formations you can expect when you get into the caves. So as the water drips uh, from the cave roof, it creates some formations called um, some formations uh, called um, stalactites. And this grow uh, from, from the roof growing downwards. And these formations are formed from the um, deposition of that um, calcium carbonate as it, 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 it precipitates. And then 
um, where the water drops, you also have formations growing from, uh, forming from the ground and uh, growing up and they form stalagmites. I will, in the following slides, show some of this. Um, and then over time, these formations from the top and those from, from the bottom uh, meet, because, meet and then um, they form pillars. So these are some of the um, stalactites uh, from the cave. And these formations are amazing. They can stimulate um, human imagination. Uh, for example, if you look on the far right, for me, that looked like um, a shredded tongue, but that's uh, up to everyone's uh, imagination. And then you also have uh, formations from, from the bottom. And um, on the right, you can see the wet, um, uh, should I say sand around the wet surface around um, where the water is dripping and you see a formation a very young formation uh, growing. And then um, these are the other formations. And then you also have pillars. And if you look on the left, on the left picture, you can see the, that uh, the formations are joined and they formed a, filler, a pillar. But if you look closely on the, on, on the uh, floor, you can see the white material um, the, the traces of um, that were left by flowing water uh, rich in calcium carbonate from um, these materials. And this is the dissolved material that formed these um, pillars. If you look at the pillar in between the two pictures, you can see um, that it can also you know, stimulate your imagination. For me, that looked like two on the roof, it looked like um, more like skulls of lions. And at the bottom there, um, the pillar itself, more like an, a scared angel. You know, it's up to you to, to think there are many formations to, you know, um, that will, will uh, stimulate or ignite your imagination. And on the far right, you can see the joints clearly of the stalactites uh, and the stalagmites. You can see here that this is the joining uh, uh, site or the joining part of the of these formations. Here, um, the, the formations are not totally joined, but the, I don't know if this was disturbed, but they're about to join. So <clears throat> these formations um, can give you an impression about the age of, of the cave. If you see a lot of um, big pillars, then it might give an impression that this cave has been formed um, a long time um, as compared to where you, you find very young, uh, still growing stalactites and very few pillars that might give an impression that uh, the cave is relatively young. So, um, the cave biodiversity of um, the, the biodiversity of, of um, we have the caves include um, bat species. And as I mentioned, bat species are very important to cave ecosystems because they link the uh, food web of the cave ecosystem with the outside um, or the surface um, uh, uh, food webs or ecosystem. And that link is crucial because it is more like the root of, um, um, of energy uh, in, 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 in flow. So there are currently uh, three species of birds um, described in the, in, in, sorry, in the Cuyahaba um, Caves. And this include the slit-faced uh, birds, the horseshoe birds, and the leaf-nosed bat, which is the largest uh, bat in the largest uh, insectivorous bat in Southern Africa. So all these bats are um, insectivorous. I, 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 I had hoped that 
you know, they are kind of uh, those which feed on fruits and those that fed on um, insects because it would make it possible more like to map their uh, use of the roof using uh, stable isotopes. Um, so all of these pets are, are, are insectivorous. And in terms of their um, conservation status, they are least threatened. They, they are not threatened species, they are of least concern. But it is important to note that their populations are, are declining, okay? A, a lot of them populations are on the decline. So even though they are not, they are, they have less concern. They are very crucial to to conserve, to conserve, especially given their role in a cave ecosystems. In terms of um, other vertebrates, um, I will share some of um, the exciting experiences I've had in in um, in Kihaba. So there, uh, I saw an owl, an owl in in Kihaba caves, and I'll tell you how I got to see the owl. So we were um, in the cave and we had forgotten, the team had forgotten uh, one of the equipments that we are using and they left me in the cave. So I decided to switch off the, the light. I, I was a bit scared to do that, but I did it. So I switched off and I didn't move a bit. I said, I, for some time, it was just, just like that. And then I just immediately switched the light and I saw an owl. I didn't see an, only an owl. I, see, uh, I, I saw a rat in the cave. And uh, so these are some of the, and this was in the deepest part of the cave, the, uh, the humid and ever dark uh, zone of the cave. And then um, there's also a sign that um, lepers are using the cave, especially um, the entrance zone, and because there are some evidence from this, they sometimes drag their kills into the cave. You could see bones of small undulates and sometimes the, the markings of um, the footprints of the, of the lepers. Um, porcupines also use the cave and they use mostly the uh, entrance, cave entrance and the twilight zone and not much of the deeper uh, zone. So these are some of the um, uh, biodiversity of the Kihaba caves. Um, <clears throat> there are also a lot of um, insects um, in the cave, especially in, in the deeper zone the dark zone, there are a lot of cave cockroaches, a lot of cave cockroaches. Um, but you also have um, other uh, insects like um, cave crickets, which I observe them to be um, most abundant in, in the cave entrance and the twilight um, uh, zone. Um, and then um, we, I, the study I, um, I undertook or I did for my Oxford um, University of Oxford thesis um, is the only quantitative ecology work that has been done in, in, in Kihaba Caves. So you can, you know, have an idea that there is still a lot um, to, to understand in the cave. There's still a lot of beauty to unveil about the, the caves. So one interesting thing about cave biology, so, so cave ecosystems or cave species is the question of um, where, how did this species come to be in the caves and how um, they've evolved over time? Why do some species have, um, you know, some features that, um, like why do some some species lack um, sight apparatus? Why are some species blind? So this is these are some of the interesting 
uh, questions that um, uh, cave ecologists ask themselves. And still on that, um, it is important to note that the first ever attempt to explain um, the phenomena of um, blindness was um, attempted by Charles Darwin. And his explanations um, were in the modern um, science, not uh, Darwinism. Um, and I will get to, 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 to explain more of that in, in my later slides. So there's a lot of um, uh, richness in terms of um, uh, improving knowledge in science and, and species that uh, caves offer. Um, despite that, the cave, the Kehava caves are really understudied. Like for example, the microbiota is not described. There's no single study which has described, uh, for example, the kind of bacteria that you find in, in, in Kehava caves, the kind of fungal species that you find in the Kehava caves. But um, um, that has, you know, knowledge of that is really um, potentially um, useful um, to improve human welfare and, um, and, and to boost economies, you know. So, why should we, why should we have a cave biodiversity be surveyed? They, to effectively conserve um, cave biodiversity, we need to create an awareness of um, what we are aiming to, to conserve. We need to know uh, what we are aiming to conserve, what kind of habitats are important. For example, if we were to improve or advance cave tourism in, 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 in um, to have a caves, which in case we are tempted to provide some lighting, you know, the, those formations, when they are lit, they become even more exciting to the human eye. But which sites can we light? Which sites do we conserve? All these questions will be informed by knowledge of what we want to conserve. So knowledge of, of the biodiversity will inform um, habitat protection efforts uh, knowledge of the cave biodiversity will, be, will benefit the search for um, genes and bioactive compounds that have diverse um, biotechnological and, and medicinal uh, applications. These are some of the potential um, benefits of um, genes and bioactive compounds that we may discover in, in, in Kehaba Caves if we you know, invest to understand the ecosystem if we invest to protect the ecosystem. So recently, there's a, a general consensus in, uh, in science um, among scientists of the world, across the world that um, novel bioactive compounds and novel genes um, mostly found in uh, extreme environments. And as I described before, uh, caves are extreme environments. They have unique biodiversity, yet they are one of the least explored um, ecosystems. So genes from, um, or bioactive compounds from uh, caves, cave species, such as um, a certain bacteria called actinobacteria, um, specifically within that, um, actinomycetes, has potential to, you know, address problems such, such as biocorrosion. Uh, has potential. Um, biocorrosion, by the way, is the, you know, uh, destruction of uh, things like um, metal um, tubes in in um, plumbing systems, or in gas infrastructure, or in any other um, materials that use. Um, are based on uh, connection, whose connections are based on, on metal. So there are bacteria that can actually um, uh, derive energy from that. They can um, um, break down such um, metals. And actinomycetes 
which were initially thought to be fungi, have um, can produce produce um, bioactive uh, compounds which are antibacterial in um, nature. So they can be used uh, to you know solve problems such as bio corrosion. They can also be used as the bio compounds can be used as pesticides, and they can be applied to enhance plant uh, plant growth. They can be used also to, um, you know, for bioremediation because some of the species can actually break down uh, uh, oils and, and some of these compounds. So they can, uh, cave species can also be used um, in, in, in medicine. Um, apart from the bacteria, you know, some proteins from spiders can be used to um, help in, you know, um, for therapeutic use in uh, to to help managing or curing diseases such as cancer. So, <clears throat> I want to talk um, now about the beauty of Trihava Caves as a natural laboratory. So, caves um, provide a constant environment constant gradient of light from the light and uh, zone in the entrance to the um, uh, twilight zone to the deeper um, um, permanently dark zones. They also provide a gradient in air circulation, in humidity and in other um, factors. And these are very stable uh, environments that um, you know can act as a, a a natural laboratory to advance um, science theory. For example, um, some troglomorphic feature, uh, some troglomorphic features, uh, troglomorphic features. If you remember the earlier pictures I've shown uh, of some pale organisms like such as blind um that blind fish and um, that pale pseudoscorpion. Um, these are features associated with being in the um, dark zone permanently. So one of the questions, for example, is whether these are due to lack of um, stimuli at developmental stage stages to stimulate um, pigment production? Or is it because these organisms don't have the genes that um, produce pigment? Or in the case of site, is it because the organisms lack some genes that are um, you know, responsible for site apparatus? Or is it because there is no stimulus, environmental stimulus? So these are some of the you know, questions that uh, uh, it's, it's an ongoing, um, you know, uh, discussion. And as I said, the first person to explain um, lack of sight in cave organisms was Charles Darwin. And in his explanation, um, remember that time the things like genes were not known, the DNA was not known. So it was, um, you know, explanations which were a bit at a rough uh, level um, in terms of um, uh, expressions of, um, of features in, 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 in organisms. So that still uh, has to um, be, it, it's still a conversation that is ongoing and Prehaba caves have that potential, especially because much of the cave theory and cave studies were done in, um, environments, uh, temperate environments, for example, very few studies have been done um, in environments such as Botswana, where the surface temperatures are highly fluctuating. So we still, we have to have to help us to advance knowledge about cave ecology in arid environments. So far, um, a preliminary study by myself and a colleague in Oxford, in, in University of Oxford, is the only quantitative 
a survey of the cave, um, or to have a cave found. So um, I want to talk about, um, continue to talk about the Kihava cave as a, a treasure, as a, as a beauty, uh, a beautiful natural laboratory. So I, I earlier talked about um, stalagmites and this um, thing, uh, formations form over a very long time to achieve a big size. And they, over time, they form layers um, more similar to tree um, rings that can be used um, together with um, stable isotope techniques. They can be used to make um, inferences about past climate. And given the proximity um, of the Kehave Caves to the Okavango Delta, uh, this can, you know, complement the studies um, in the Okavango Delta, especially those uh, looking to infer on um, uh, past events. Okay, so we have a caves, um, you know, very, um, uh, you know, um, beautiful in that regard. Um, I wanted to say something about, so if you look on the picture, um, the cave guards are doing a very good job. They are protecting the formations of this young uh, stalagmites. You can see around that uh, wet area and a very tiny forming uh, stalagmite that they've put um, some rocks so that um, people coming in, they can um, not um, destroy, they may not destroy the formations. So um, my ongoing research at the caves include um, microclimate characterization of the cave. So in, in a basic sense, I'm trying to see uh, how the cave's environment fluctuates relative to the surface. What you see, the tiny um, thing you see there uh, with the three is a uh, a data logger for temperature and, and, and um, humidity. And it records temperature and, and humidity, humidity on hourly intervals, such that um, you can describe the, the microclimate of the, the cave um, in terms of um, day versus night fluctuations, or in terms of seasonal, or seasonal changes, okay? So <clears throat> I've put those um, data loggers across the zones of the, of, the, um, of the cave from the mouth to the deepest end. Uh, some of my uh, ongoing, one of my ongoing research is since I've done uh, a preliminary survey, I am now um, undertaking a, a comprehensive survey which I'm doing with my MSc student, he's looking, he's revisiting uh, the, the survey of uh, um, macroinvertebrates in the, in, the, in the cave. And he's doing that over a period of a year to see how they seasonally change um, in terms of their um, uh, abundances and, and distributions in the cave. And, um, Earlier on, I, I mentioned, um, I introduced Colby. Um, she's, she's going to look at um, some troglom troglomorphism against uh, the gradient of, well, of light. You could say of light or of dark, because she's going to measure um, some appendages from organ organisms uh, from the cave mouth, you know, uh, um, along the, the cave system right to the deeper, uh, permanently dark zone. And this will hopefully add to the conversation of whether some of these features are due to environmental stimuli or, or the, 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 because of genetic makeup. So what is the beauty of, of we have a caves in terms of 
cave tourism. So the exact figures um, are unavailable, but cave tourism is yet to establish that we have a caves. It's important to mention uh, one of the uh, important uh, efforts to improve cave tourism um, at Kuihava Caves. And this is the Kuihava project, which um, was started in 2009 after the uh, area, the concession um, was converted from multi-use to photograph uh, a concession. You know, what I mean by that is the type of uh, tourism that was done in that area was converted um, to uh, photo tourism. Um, and that was, um, I think, coincided with the ban in uh, hunting. So it meant that the limit, there was relatively lim more limited uh, tourists coming to the area because some it would come to the cave uh, because they happen to be there. Uh, for, cave, for for hunting and they would visit the cave. So when the concession was switched from multi-use to um, cave, sorry, to photo tourism, there were efforts made to improve um, accommodation um, at the cave. And for that, there, there are some campsites which were built. What you see on this picture is a staircase on the, on this um, south, um, entrance of the cave. And these are some of the things that were uh, done to improve cave tourism at the other caves. Um, I also want to mention that as part of uh, efforts to improve cave tourism there, um, uh, at the other caves, there were uh, boreholes that were drilled and this was to attract animals so that um, people can take photos um, and um, within the locality of Kehava Caves. The key message that I want to leave you with is that um, caves are such an important uh, ecosystems and they harbor or they accommodate a very valuable and vulnerable, valuable yet vulnerable um, species. So that is the key message and 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 they need to be understood. The cave ecosystems need to be understood for um, sustainable um, cave tourism and sustainable or effective conservation of this potentially um, uh, very valuable um, species. So I will end my talk here. And um, I thank you very much for taking your time off to listen to me. Thank you. Richard, I'm curious to know if there are plans to develop Kui Harbour's tourism further. Um, as, you, as you pointed out, there's not only the attraction of the caves and, and uh, the wild animals, but there's also a very strong Basarwa community at Kaikai, isn't there? Um, and that, that could be a component of the tourism attraction. I'm just wondering if there are plans to take it forward. Thank you very much for, for that question. Uh, you have all um, um, actually helped me to, you know, I, I skipped this important, you know, component of, we uh, have a con uh, context that they, they are the Kai Kai um, San people who are the nearest settlement uh, to the cave. So <clears throat> the, the developments, um, they they are on they are well they are ongoing. That's why in that slide I put a dash and I didn't put a year, is because they they ran out of funds. But um, ideally they would want to continue the the developments. And at the very yeah this uh, on another note you 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 asked about the 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 other cave the Kudum cave, Wadum sorry. Um, oh, yeah, I, mean, I mentioned that earlier because I was one of the party that yeah. discovered it. Yeah, I was excited to hear that you are one of the 
<clears throat> the, the, the earlier expo explorers of the caves. That is, um, I'm very happy to, to meet you. Um, so the, the other cave is, um, is still not accessible without um, the, the, that kind of equipment, the cave equipment. So it's not, um, it's currently actually kind of not allowed, we are not allowed, people are not allowed to, to go into that cave. It's, um, this is to protect people because without the equipment, really, you cannot get into the cave. Yeah, that, I agree. That's understandable. It is quite inaccessible. And, um, and, and from a, a, a preservation point of view, it, um, it had some incredibly unique cave formations. So I think the decision was taken not to allow the general public in there. But yeah, I, I really do hope that the main caves, and I'm not sure about Koanaka, but I really do hope that tourism can be encouraged there because there is a beautiful mix of wildlife cave tourism and the, the Basarua or the sand from yeah. Kai Kai. It, the, the potential's yeah. there. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for a great talk. Thank you, Richard, for a really interesting talk. Uh, my questions, and they're, they're very slow, uh, but I was wondering if the speed of the growth depends on water flow or if it's fairly consistent uh, growth and if you get layers that can be dated like tree rings or if you have a very wet year is there more subsurface water flow and the stalagmites and stalactites grow faster. Um, so something along those lines. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure, but I'll be, um, it's again worth noting, and I hope um, the, my colleagues here, I'm going to the caves um, in about two weeks with a colleague who's an expert uh, on that. I hope he's, he's in this um, room, chat room. Um, I don't know much about um, the, you know, finer details, but I suppose that um, on a, 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 a year, a very wet year, you would have a lot of uh, precipitation uh, compared to um, on a, that is why they are used to, to construct past climate in terms of, you could use the, the stable isotopes, the, the, the um, stable isotope signatures, and also possibly the, um, physical appearances of the of the rings yeah mm. thank you very much uh, richard for this uh, inspiring um, presentation um apparently this cave has been in existence for over 2000 years yeah. and uh, let alone the others that are situated around it and i believe there are villagers there are populations around those caves. Um, maybe just to add, as I say, add on what Clarissa earlier on said, maybe just to expand that a little bit. Yeah. Is there any efforts that the government is doing to try and uh, enhance the, you know, the, uh, the economy of uh, Botswana, let alone the villages around there, education, uh, finance-wise, and the stuff like that, you know? We're living in changing times where education is key yeah. in any form or the other. That's a very um, good comment and question. Um, <clears throat> the, the, we have uh, caves. Um, uh, under and I, I think I should have mentioned this. This you know question answer sessions help you to you know um, sometimes bring the information that you you may have skipped in the main talk. So the Kihaba is is uh, managed by uh, the the trust the the um, village Kaka village trust. It's called the Tabolula trust. So some of the, the money 
go to the welfare of, of those people. Um, in terms of trying to improve te uh, cave tourism, the Botswana government uh, through uh, Botswana Tourism Organization have, uh, you know, since 2009 in, in, uh, engaged in the Three Harbor project and that aimed to improve cave tourism and hopefully uh, so that it, it benefits the, the, the same community and, and the community, the, the economy in general. And I must mention also that our former president, um, uh, Lieutenant Sasraza Kama Ian Kama, was very passionate about the project, such that people believed that he had the keys uh, to the to the caves. My my computer freezed when I was about to show you a slide uh, with a picture from a local newspaper showing that. Um, the president no longer has the keys to the caves. So he was one of those uh, prominent figures in terms of trying to promote cave tourism at uh, Tuihama. Thanks, Richard, for a very interesting talk. Uh, learned a lot of interesting things, especially about the small animals. Um, I was just, uh, and I, I may have missed bits of the talk, unfortunately I had some problems, but um, I don't think you mentioned any evidence of human habitation or rock art or anything like that in the caves. Is there is there any evidence of that? And possibly if there isn't, could it be attributed to the the bats? Um, and, you know, I, I know that some caves have bats and guano that causes people to have diseases and then they die. And maybe that's also the link to um, the superstitions about caves amongst um, some of the traditional people. Yeah, um, thanks. It's, it's a good question. I, it, it also, you know, helps me to open my eyes even more when I go to the caves to look for this human um, prints or art, artworks. But so far, um, I haven't seen any. And um, there's also evidence from previous studies that um, the beds um, contribute to you know, er uh, erosion of the, the formations. So if there were some uh, prints in um, human, I don't know how, what effort would take to remove them, but possibly if they, they, they was, and there is this erosion taking place because of the beds that over time might have maybe rubbed that off. But so far I haven't seen any, any print. But maybe my the guide can chip in because they know the cave. You know, he he, he says he can switch off the 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 the, um, the torch at the deepest end and still find his way out. So he might wow. be uh, able to <laughs> say something about the, uh, the, the human art or art paintings. Is there any? Thank you, Richard. I can just. Uh... Check if um, if we need to unmute. I see Clarissa wants to come in. Maybe she's got uh, something around that. Also, Paula Menegas, I, I understand you also had uh, some uh, um, knowledge of or have been there. I'm not sure. Uh, Clarissa, please come in. And uh, Madi, thanks for a very interesting question. It is rather thought provoking why people would not have stayed there. But uh, thank you, Madi. Uh -huh. I just thought, um, especially with the proximity of the, the people living close by still, that, that it, it seemed strange because a lot of um, caves have got uh, rock art. So thanks. Um, um. Yeah. Thank you, Marie. It's, uh, it's, it, uh, it, 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 it's a good question. And it, I'm sure that Richard and his team will uh, think about this and maybe come up with some answers about that. Clarissa? Please unmute. Paolo, if you want to unmute, um, just show your hand and I will unmute you. I'm not sure if you want to come in or any of Richard, the guys. Um, my final question, well, my, my question that I want to ask you is I read somewhere that Quihaba had been submitted um, as a potential UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
Has there been any news or feedback or, or, or what do you think the chances are of it, of it attaining that status? Thank you. Um, I, I don't know much, but uh, what I know is um, because I also sometimes know this through reading is that it's, um, it's been proposed, but I don't know the outcome. So it seems like it's still a proposed site for a, a, a heritage, UNESCO heritage site. Mm. 